Welcome to another episode of our Inner Sparks Featured Stories. I am Lily Yen, your host of this podcast and founder of Our Inner Sparks Network, a network of ordinary women sharing our extraordinary stories. We all have so many inspiring women around us in our lives, our sisters, our neighbors, our friends, our mothers, our grandmothers, and our daughters. We need to acknowledge and celebrate each of these women's successes. Let's do that together. Let's use these opportunities as ways to inspire and empower each other and others. Join me to discover, embody, and share our inner sparks. In this episode, we are very fortunate to be chatting with Emma Rush, one of Canada's finest classical guitarists. She has toured across Canada and has performed in Sweden, Germany, Mexico, and China. Emma is well-recognized across the world for her warm sound, virtuosic techniques, and powerful stage presence. Emma has two CD releases, Canadiana and Folklorica. They include so many beautiful classical guitar pieces. Emma is an avid collaborator. She has performed alongside other great musicians and music establishments. She's also a part of the dynamic flute and guitar duo, Azaline Duo. Recently, Emma was featured alongside other amazing Canadian artists in the Group of Seven Guitar Project documentary, commissioned by the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. Emma is truly a busy lady in the music world. She's also a founder and an artistic director of Guitar Hamilton that features many wonderful concerts and events all year long, including the Hamilton International Guitar Festival. I am so excited, so let's get right to it. Hi, Emma. Hi, Emily. Nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story today. We're looking forward to hearing all about your different endeavors within the music world. Sure. Could you give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself? Who is Emma? (laughs) Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm a classical guitarist. I'm based in Hamilton in Ontario. I do sort of a few different things. I guess I'm primarily a performer. So I play a lot of different solo concerts here in Canada and around the world. And then I also play quite a lot with Sara Traficante, a flutist as Azaline Duo. And then I've got, you know, sort of various other performing projects I do or guest appearances. And then I'm also an educator. So I teach guitar at Mohawk College in Hamilton. And then I've also got a pretty busy home studio. Uh, And I do a lot of master classes when I'm out on the road, too. And then as an arts administrator, I run a little nonprofit here called Guitar Hamilton, which is sort of presenting classical guitar music while artists from around the world and sort of getting them on stage here at home. That's amazing. Sounds like a lot of things that's going on. You are not only well known in the Canadian scenes, you've been internationally recognized as well. I wanted to ask you, how did you get started with classical guitar? Because classical guitar is not really a big instrument that everybody knows very well. Um, I actually got started quite late. Um, So it was after high school. And I think What happens with a lot of people is they just hear the sound of the classical guitar and they fall in love with it. And that's definitely what happened to me. So I had a couple of friends that were studying, they're studying guitar actually at Mohawk College where I teach now. And I just heard them playing and I just thought it was the best. And I decided basically immediately that that was a path I wanted to follow. I had had learned sort of other instruments when I was a kid. So I had grown up playing piano, I played the cello, I played the oboe. So I already could sort of like read music and I played a lot of classical music. So I wasn't starting like right from zero, but it was still, um, I had to do like a lot of catching up to get into school, which I did the following year. And then I think I was playing catch up for many, many years after because it was such a late start. But yeah, it was just sort of a, a spur of the moment you know, decision. I sort of heard the guitar and thought, yep, that's for me. That's amazing. For those who don't know, would you explain what's the difference between acoustic guitar and classical guitar? The guitars like look pretty similar. Like you would recognize a classical guitar for sure as a guitar. Um, but the classical guitar has nylon strings, which makes it have a kind of warmer sound. And then also um, just the technique in playing it. So instead of using 
uh, a pick to strum the guitar or pick a melody line, we're actually using like the fingernails on our right hand to do that. And so it means we can play sort of a melody and a bass line and accompaniment all at the same time. So we can kind of do a lot of different styles of music with that. Like we say classical guitar, but that's a pretty broad umbrella of like the types of music that we play because we play everything from like traditional classical music and then we can play like very early music we play very modern music we play latin music spanish music you know music from all over the world so there's like really quite a big sort of range of repertoire that sort of falls into the classical guitar category right you've done so much in canada and internationally and you've been involved in so many activities in the music world in different organizations and teaching as well uh, you do concerts and you've released, you know, CDs and films or been involved. Can you talk to us about that as well? Oh, okay. Yeah, that was a great, great project. It was not my project, but I was uh, in it. So it was a project from the McMichael Gallery. And they had um, done this project called the Group of Seven Guitars. And they commissioned seven different luthiers to build seven different guitars. And each one was inspired by um, a certain member of the Canadian group of seven, the painters. And one luthier was a classical builder, Sergei de Young. And so they made a big documentary about this project. And I was very fortunate to be um, asked by Sergei to be in it, to play his guitar, which was an incredible birch bark classical guitar. What an amazing project to be involved in. Oh, it was so fun. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you've done so much, right? In the music world. What do you enjoy the most as a musician? Wow, that's such a hard question because there's, I think the reason why I'm um, I'm not super focused on just one direction in the music world is because I do enjoy so many things, you know, like I really, really love performing, but I also, I'm really connected with my students, you know, I have a really rewarding, you know, sort of teaching aspect of my career, and then I'm... Uh, I really do love arts administration, which I don't know if everybody does, but like, you know, I get really excited about writing grant proposals and things. Wow. Yeah. Uh, You don't hear that from artists very often. (laughs) Yeah. So I think that's actually something that has worked out really well for me because I do enjoy that sort of administrative stuff. I've been able to focus a lot of that energy on, on working to secure funding for different projects. Like I've been very lucky to have a lot of support from different granting bodies over the last few years. And I think it's because I don't mind, you know, sitting down and getting stuck into the the writing up the project and doing the budgets and Yeah, don't mind doing the hard work actually. There's a lot of work around that, understanding, you know, which organization that you can actually tie into and how your vision aligns with their vision could potentially Definitely. get paid for, right? So great job on that. Um, there's a lot of activities because of what you do are being funded. Let's talk about the life as an artist. We often hear people say artists don't make money. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, no, seriously, like people say that when kids are trying to get into arts and you hear parents say, hey, you, know, you want to consider other things too, because yeah. uh, being an artist don't really make you a lot of money. But what motivated you to become a musician and now doing it as a full-time career? Probably fortunately, I did not think about the financial aspect when I started, you know, so Maybe had I realized how difficult a career in music can be, uh, I might have thought twice, so I'm glad I didn't. But I think, like, the most important thing is to, I think, just sort of define what your product is and then, like, actually put it out in the world, you know? Because I know so many incredible guitarists that are sitting at home, you know, playing (laughs) when it would be, you know, sort of hoping somebody might knock on their door and ask them to play a concert, where if you actually have taken the time to either do it yourself or get someone to do it for you, you know, to like get your ideas and your, your artistic product out into the world, then things start happening. I mean, I know what I did was I, I just sort of dove into a lot of different resources about how to be a self-managed musician, you know, all the things we don't sort of learn in school. Like how do you write a letter to a promoter to get a concert? How do you, what does a promo picture look like and how much should you spend on it? And all these sort of things, these details that we don't really know. So I just did like so much research to sort of figure out how I could make a viable career as a self-managed musician. Um, and so it, it's worked out for me, you know, for sure. I have lifestyle choices that enable that as well. You know, like I don't drive a car, <laughs> so I don't need to That's make right. 
you know, so I don't have a lot of things I, I need. In the meantime, I, I'm definitely like super comfortable and it's all from making music. Right. And you're doing what you enjoy, you love, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and for and me, I, this is something really important. Like the way my days normally look as well, I, it's different every day. You know, I might do some teaching, I might be performing, I might be on the road, I might be at home. And that's something I really sort of thrive on where a lot of people don't feel so comfortable without more structure or more of a routine. But I feel like I would probably feel stifled with that. <laughs> so for me, it lets me have um, like a very loosely structured life where I can really do projects that I'm really into, you know, like new recording projects or commissioning new works, whatever, things that do really sort of take a lot of time, but I'm able to sort of build that into my schedule, which is really important to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it just sounds like you know, having the flexibility is a part of ar an artist's life, right? You, you do yeah. want that flexibility so that you can be creative. Um, but it also sounds like you're very structured. You know, you talked about thinking of what you do as a product and, and having the vision out there and selling that vision and communicating to the right people and then also marketing it the right way. I think it's very structured as well in, in some ways. And I think that combination is helping you really to get the exposure that you're getting. So yeah. congratulations on that. Yeah. What is one challenge that you have or the most concerning piece that you have in your career? Oh, what a great question. I, I mean, I guess there are just a number of challenges, right? Like you kind of have to always be looking for the next gig and for the next project and making sure that you're like the same as any self-employed field, I would say, you know, you constantly have to be making sure you've got something lined up in the calendar. And I know I find it quite tricky sometimes. Like if I have a season where I've booked loads and loads of concerts and I'm on the road a lot, I find it hard to find the time to think about two seasons from now, <laughs> you know, like when I, when it's planning, what I'll actually be doing then. Um, so making sure that you are sort of always sort of planning for the future, I think is quite, it's challenging for me anyways. So looking at those short-term and the long-term goals. And what you yeah, want to exactly. And balancing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course there's the, you know, I think just being a performer is challenging sort of mentally or emotionally, you know, it is a sort of a constant process of putting yourself out there and putting your ideas in front of the public and, so you have to find ways to make that positive experience. Right. So how do you go about doing that, like making a positive when you feel like you're being challenged? I guess I've, I've just like performed so much that I don't tend to get uh, like really anxious anymore about, um, about performing. But I do, um, you know, I definitely, if I've got a new program I'm working on or some new project I've, you know, sort of dreamt up. I do use my colleagues a lot to sort of run my ideas by them and see, you know, as well as friends and family and just make sure for sure, for sure that I'm really happy <laughs> with the ideas. Or I'm really happy with like what I'm playing before it gets into the, the public eye. So I guess I just sort of really make sure I'm super prepared. Yeah. It sounds like you're like, you know, you've got a really great support system around you and you, you know, leverage the network and the support that you have from from the, the people in the network of people that you have. And that kind of flows into a lot of what you also do for them. Cause I, I know based on, you know, just knowing you and also reading up on your website uh, that you're involved in a lot of different organizations, um, yeah. whether it's, you know, taking a part as a uh, guest performer on a, in a festival or uh, anything else. Can you tell us maybe a favorite project that you've been on that you're excited about? Oh, sure. One of the most fun things I've been working on in the last few years uh, is with my colleague, Will Douglas, who's based in Texas, and our other friend, Kevin Manderville, who's in Alabama. Uh, but the three of us direct the Collegiate Peaks Guitar Retreat, which is in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And it's, um, it was just kind of a super zany idea, which was that we want to offer in this sort of week-long retreat uh, everything you'd expect from a guitar festival, which would be master classes, ensemble, concerts, um, lessons, mm -hmm. uh, combined with a selection of outdoor adventures. And we didn't know if the idea would fly or not, but we've actually had um, a full house every year and it's just so much fun. And so it's been a really interesting um, sort of experiment to see if we can pull off this guitar event up in the mountains in the middle of nowhere. Um, Sounds beautiful but, though. Like the sound and the scene that you're describing, <laughs> just like guitar in a, you know, serene surrounding. That absolutely. And then we do, you know, so what we wind up doing is weather depending, you know, we either, 
you know, if it looks like rain in the afternoon, we'll go out in the morning, we'll do a huge hike, you know, along some beautiful mountain ridge. And then in the afternoon, we'll retreat to like our cabin and do some guitar playing, some guitar lessons. And then every night we've got a concert. And oh, then the wow. next day it might be something different. I mean, we've gone uh, trail riding with horses. We've gone uh, ATVing. We've gone whitewater rafting. We've what an amazing project. Mountains to these ghost towns. So it's really just been great. And we've got almost everyone that has come to that event has come back for the subsequent years. So we've got a great group that we've really connected with. And I think that's something really special about that event. And it's something I kind of look for whenever I'm sort of involved in running a guitar event of any kind. It's just a way to make it sort of grow into a community so that, right. you know, you're not just providing guitar education or something to people, but you're also like really creating a network and, you know, sort of building these relationships within, you know, all sort of levels of the guitar world. Based on what you just said in terms of that project, you're really merging a lot of different things together into one. And mm-hmm. making it that, you know, music not as a standalone thing, but rather a part of that greater recreation type of activities together. And then, you know, you, you find people who are like-minded, right? So that yeah. network kind of will grow in that way. And that's just, that's amazing. It sounds wonderful. I know you are also a part of a dynamic duo, <laughs> which you mentioned earlier. And I know that you got a lot of projects and a lot of things going on with that one as well. Would you like to give us a little bit more detail on that? Absolutely. So Sara Traficante, who's an incredible flutist, uh, and I have been working together for uh, about six years now. And we just love working together. And our, our sort of initial repertoire was Spanish and South American music. It's all very high energy, super engaging. The focus is kind of on providing music that is really quality classical music for those people that are, you know, classical music fans, but that it also offers a lot for people that might not be used to listening to classical music. So we want, you know, if you, maybe if you're somebody that thought a classical music concert would be stuffy or boring, (laughs) which is some people think, uh, the idea is that after you saw our concert, you would definitely not think that anymore and you would be really into seeing more classical music concerts. Well, that's amazing. So um, something we're really into is um, like we really try and use every single part of our instrument. So the guitar has um, not just sort of regular guitar plucking, but there's loads of strumming, there's loads of percussion. Um, Sara does wild things with the flute, so she sings through it. She does all these percussive effects. So, um, And then we just released a new album uh, called Fandango. And... On that, we sort of branched out a little bit in terms of like where our repertoire comes from. So instead of just focusing on Spanish and South American music, we've also included um, five beautiful um, Celtic pieces by the British composer Gerald Garcia. And for that, Sara plays like a wooden Celtic flute and also a tin whistle, <laughs> which is wow. really cool. We've got these fabulous Macedonian pieces, a set of four by Miroslav Tadic, and Sara uses the alto flute for that. So we sort of switched up our instruments a little bit and to add sort of, you know, just another aspect to our concerts. That sounds amazing. Different texture and the sound that you get. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Sounds like a great partnership that you have. I'm looking at it as you are a solo guitarist, right? So Mm -hmm. you're used to doing solo work. What's it like being a partnership? And uh, have you found that challenging at times? Oh, great question. Um... (laughs) Yeah, I actually, I didn't play a lot of chamber music, like a lot of ensemble music, until I started working with Sara. So there were a lot of challenges, as I was so used to just being in my own world. Solo right. <laughs> sort of, guitarist, right? Yeah, and that's exactly. Guitar. There were definitely challenges in terms of, um, like, making the ensemble playing really seamless, you know, so we're really playing together. Also, it just sort of really opened my ears I guess to like Sara just has like a fabulous sense of phrasing so like listening to that and working with her I think like improved my own musicianship so much and then aside from that like aside from just I I feel like every time Sara and I work together it really does like I said it just like really improves my own playing but it's just really fun like it's fun actually to go on tour with somebody else and it's fun to share the stage with somebody you know it's just an absolutely different vibe than a solo concert and I'm love playing solo concerts and I love the feeling of doing that but I also I really really enjoy this ensemble work as well it's a it's a really nice nice way to make music 
Yeah, and, and the flute and guitar together sounds amazing, by the way. I, I love the sound. Oh, yeah, me too. And I feel so fortunate that I'm able to work with, like, such a versatile flutist. So it means we're really able to, like, blend our sound together really well. And we both can sort of really explore everything that guitar and flute can do together. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned at the top of the program that you're from Hamilton. Yeah. And you also are the founder yeah. for Guitar Hamilton. Tell us a little bit about Guitar Hamilton. Sounds so exciting. Yeah, so when I moved, uh, like I'm originally from Hamilton, but I was away for oh, 11 years or so for various different degrees, etc. But I came back to Hamilton sort of accidentally in 2007. And when I arrived here, it was it's kind of a guitar wasteland, I guess. <laughs> what do you <laughs> like mean? There really wasn't too much going on. There were no concerts. Well, I initially saw that as being like quite depressing and lonely. Mm. But then I really thought that was an opportunity. So Hamilton at the time was kind of undergoing this like arts renaissance. You know, it was um, the art sector in Hamilton was really becoming more and more important to the city. And so I feel like the time was really good for my idea to start Guitar Hamilton. Definitely a lot of support. So it seemed like there was a, a void there that Guitar Hamilton could fill. So mm -hmm. it started off... Um, Basically, it started because like, a colleague had asked if I could set up a concert. And then I just thought, why don't I just start a whole series? Yeah. Uh, so we did two years of the concert series before starting the festival. So it's a three-day summer music festival. Um, and then we just have sort of all kinds of things going on. So we've got like our main stage series, bigger name artists. We've got a salon series where we um, showcase sort of more up-and-coming talents. Or if it's a really sort of specialist program we might program it for a smaller space uh, we do community outreach concerts master classes we coordinate um, sometimes with Mohawk College or Redeemer University to um, you know present educational stuff with them and then the festival in the summer is all things guitar so we've got guitar makers we've got concerts classes workshops lessons ensemble <laughs> so the whole the whole gamut and I love what you said. I mean, you could have thought of this when you came back to City of Hamilton and when you felt that there wasn't a lot going on in the guitar world, that you, you could have, you know, felt lonely. And yeah. <laughs> instead, you, you, you took that energy and said, um, that's an opportunity. I really like what you just said. Mark. And, and then making all this happen, you know, the different series that you're talking about is just amazing. A great opportunity for well-known artists as well as upcoming artists and new people who are trying to get into the guitar world. It's absolutely amazing. I know you have a, an event coming up end of March, March 28th, you said? Yeah. Uh, was gala, right? Yeah, I think it's one of the best events we present, actually. So it's, it's a fundraiser to support the festival. Because um, Guitar Hamilton is actually... It's only funded by ticket sales and the odd sort of private donation. We don't have any funding municipally, provincially, federally from foundations or anything. So it's all just funded by people that want to be attending Guitar Hamilton events. So yeah, so we do this festival or yeah, festival fundraiser called Gala Guitar Night. And the first half of the program is basically a variety show of different amazing classical guitarists. And again, we always showcase a couple really talented um, sort of emerging artists. And then we've got some professional artists that come in and donate their time, which is just incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the sort of crown jewel of this concert is we've got the Hamilton Guitar Orchestra, which ranges, I think the smallest orchestra we had was 44 people. And then we had uh, more than 60 last year. Um, so it's sort of a huge group of guitarists and we, we do sort of a 20 minute set to end the concert, which is just so much fun. And that's, um, directed by Tim Phelan and we've got spots in the orchestra for people of all levels, right? So we wind up getting, you know, maybe young beginners, we get hobby players, we get, uh, people maybe doing their masters, you know, we got like the whole right. range of skill levels and all different kinds of people, um, so it's just so fun. And they all show up. We rehearse one day only. And they so we all just show up and the piece magically, well, it's not magical. It's like the hard work, the orchestra. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it feels very magical that at the end of the evening, we're able to present 
you know, a professional concert uh, for the public here. So it's, it's a really fun event. I think, you know, top quality musicians, absolutely. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you guys get together in one day and put all that together. It's really, I mean, each individual brings their own talent, right? And their own pieces, but you have to put it as a cohesive concert at the end of the night. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's um, a really great event. And it's a, it's a great way to, um, I mean, for me, it's a sort of logical way to fundraise for Guitar Hamilton, right? Like what better yeah. way than with great guitar music? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we're going to do is in the show description, we're going to give a link to everybody so that they can also check it out. Highly recommend it. If you have time, um, head out to Hamilton, check it out. So as we talked about how, you know, you're so involved in the music world and well-recognized and you're so busy in so many different projects, what would one thing that you would be able to offer to somebody who is an aspiring musician that's coming on to the scene and looking to embark on a full-time music career? What would an advice be from you? I think my best advice is to just look after all of your contacts. So, I mean, um, I think, you know, the, the music world, I mean, the guitar world in particular is quite small, but I think in the wider world of music, it's also, you know, quite close knit or can be. I always think, you know, you should keep track of everybody you meet at every concert, at every event you go to, and really nurture those contacts. So, you know, when you meet somebody and have a great conversation, say, whether it's a mentor or a fellow student or somebody that's involved in some facet of the music industry, follow it up with a note, <laughs> you know, like, and keep in touch with that person. You know, mm -hmm. I do this all the time, and I feel like one of the reasons I've been able to perform so much is because I have just developed, like, such a big network of contacts that I have sort of around the world but it's not just meeting people you know and, and knowing them it's you have to sort of actually look after those relationships and and really grow them so you have your own community of people you can contact you can rely on you can ask for advice and people that uh, ideally will also help you <laughs> get some work right absolutely that's a that's a great suggestion because it's not really like you said it's not just for classical guitar or guitar or even in, in the case of, I think, this audience, it's not even just for musicians. I think anyone can really use that advice in mm -hmm. you know, their regular life or in their own careers to look at the network um, that they built, right? And how to nourish yeah. that network. Yeah. yeah definitely. And Great the other advice. thing I would really think about um, for somebody that is thinking about a career in music is I do think you can look beyond the stage. You know, sometimes um, people that are studying music that really are so focused on their instrument and so focused on this idea that they have to have this one career path, you know, that you're going to be a performer, that you'll be a solo performer or that you'll be an orchestral worker or whatever. You know, you've got this sort of one um, direction, you know, sort of plan. But I think there's so many other ways you can go either by diversifying what you might be interested in, like playing more chamber music or playing music from a different era, but even just moving beyond performance there's so many careers in music that are available that keep you in the music scene doing really creative work doing really valuable work in the art sector that might turn out to be like the perfect spot for you so i think just like keeping a really open mind about all the options that there are in creative work and maybe you know as i do like combining some of those options with a performing career or you know uh, I mean, of course, some people just are performers and that's it. <laughs> and some people are educators and that's, you know, what they're into. But um, I think just keeping a really open mind about all the all the paths there are in the world of music um, and, and sort of arts, arts work in general is really valuable. Right. Great advice to keeping your mind open and doing what you like, right? Like if you find something you like, just go do it and give it a try. And, uh, you know, in different realms, maybe it's all going to align at one point, right, as well. Yeah. 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 Very good suggestion. So what's next for Emma? What does Emma want to accomplish next? Oh, another great question. They're also good. <laughs> um, well, I've got a new solo CD that will be coming out soon. It's been recorded, but I need to... Um, edit it and uh, write up the notes and everything, uh, design a cover. But this is a project I'm really excited about. I was able to do this residency in Lübeck in Germany about a year ago, uh, where I was living there for two months. And I was there in order to research 
19th century music written by women for the guitar. Oh, wow. And this was really interesting because I didn't know if there was any. <laughs> it's sort of a big gap in the guitar repertoire as far as like female composers are concerned. It turns out there are loads. This was really exciting to just sort of discover this music that hasn't been played for, you know, 150 years or something and be able to bring it back to life. So I'm really excited about putting this CD together and being able to share all this music with the public. That'll be really great. And then I've got, uh, most of my summers are quite busy because it's festival season, you know, sort of for, yeah. for the guitar world. The beginning of June, I kick off with my own festival here in Hamilton. So July 3rd to 5th is the 10th Hamilton Guitar Festival. So that's a really big one. That's exciting. Oh, it is. Yes. Congratulations. Uh, we're at a new venue this year. So that's prevented or sort of presented different challenges and sort of had to change the format a little bit and really looking forward to seeing how that, how that comes to life. Uh, and then I'll follow that up with the Collegiate Peaks Guitar Retreat that I mentioned. I'm super happy to be in Calgary again in August at the Guitar Fest West. Uh, that's a really great festival. And um, I'll be at the Subtle Beach Guitar Festival as well at the end of uh, August, which is a delightful place to study guitar. It's another one of those you don't expect to find a guitar festival in a beach town, but there it is. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Well, again, you're just like a busy, busy lady. (laughs) How do you get it all done? Like, there's so much. That's a great question that I don't really have an answer to this time. (laughs) Well, you know, I just try and uh, actually put some different things aside each day. You know, like I try and keep a couple of hours for sort of office hours, you know, where I can just sort of go through, make sure all my emails are up to date, that I'm on top of anything that sort of has to happen at my computer. And make sure I've got a couple of hours, you know, um, at least to practice. So I just sort of break it down so the, the day sort of has all the, enough, enough hours so I can get a little bit of everything done every day. Wow. Uh, that takes a lot of discipline. Good for you. And a lot of exciting things coming out. And congratulations on them. And uh, looking forward to hearing more music from you. Oh, thank you. Okay. So in our last segment called In Search of True Fulfillment. So I'm going to ask you three questions and very short answers, either a sentence or 10 words. But the first question is, how do you define success? I guess the main thing is that I don't define it monetarily. (laughs) So for me, uh, success is being, you know, active and busy with things I love doing. Wonderful. Yes. And some people may say the second question is very similar, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. What makes you happy? What makes Emma happy in life? Well, what makes me happy? I think it's, I think that's hard to define. You know, it's, it does change day to day. Some days I'm happier being out interacting with people. Other days I'm really happy being at home working, but I do, I think I'm at my happiest when I'm being productive. So I really, I feel like I want to say like working makes me happy, but that sounds so depressing, but it's not. (laughs) <laughs> because what you do makes you happy you're passionate yeah. about what you do so I think that's awesome <laughs> so last question um, what would be one thing for everyone to take away from your story that will help them ignite and harvest their inner sparks it's just quite possible to make a really rewarding career sort of no matter what your idea is you know or no matter where you're located like I'm sure if I had sort of landed in a different town I, I, well, I wouldn't have built Guitar Hamilton, but, you know, I would have figured out another way to sort of build a community around me in my field that is rewarding for me. You know, so I think just sort of figuring out the kind of thing that, that you want in your life and then you can you can always find a way to make it happen. Oh, that's so good. Emma, like you're such a great leader, strong leader, I think, in the world of music and a talented musician as well. I'm so grateful that you're able to share your story with us. And we wish you all the success. Oh, thank you so much, Lily. It was so great talking with you. I really appreciate the chance to chat. I'm so glad we caught up. Wonderful story. Okay, so everyone, Emma and the Guitar Hamilton and her duet and a lot of projects that she discussed, those websites will be listed in our show description. So go check it out. A lot of exciting things happening. Uh, If you are in Hamilton, do consider go to the Guitar Hamilton's Gala Guitar Night, March 28th. And uh, I'll provide the link to that as well. So thank you again for listening. If you enjoy our Inner Sparks contents, 
I encourage you to subscribe and follow and share with your friends and family. Your thoughts on this episode is encouraged on all our social media sites, which are listed in the podcast description. We'll have some engaging questions on the social media sites about topics touched upon within this podcast, where you can interact with one another. Feel free to share your own related experiences, what you have learned from this podcast, and what you will take away as actions. Please always exercise mutual respect as we interact with one another. This network is a safe place for everyone to learn and grow. If you have any feedback on this podcast, the social media sites, and this network as a whole, please feel free to email me at ourinnersparks at gmail.com. Should you or someone in your life have an inspiring story you would like to see shared in our network, please feel free to email me with a nomination for future features. Thank you for listening to this episode of Our Inner Sparks Featured Stories. Music